Third speaker, Pontus Vanestal, is a service designer and human computer interaction researcher. He is the author of Designing, Designing AI Powered Services, a book that will be fe featured in our futures library, and it's also in the pop up library. So if you want to have a look at that before you leave, it's out there. Um, and he serves as a deputy professor at Halmstad University. And today he'll address AI and its potential role in circularity. Um, please welcome and give him an extra warm welcome uh, to cheer him for last week being appointed to the deputy vice chancellor with responsibility for collaboration, innovation and sustainability at Halmstad University. Please welcome Pontus Van. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very <laughs> kind. Um, I'm not going to stand in front of this. OK, so um, thanks for inviting me here. I had a, a lot of fun writing uh, one of the chapters in the book. Um, the title of my talk is Rethinking Progress and the Circular Approach in AI-Powered Service Design. And basically, we can summarize that thesis into that the future of design might not be about creating more stuff, but actually circulating better. And then we need to unpack at least two of these words. One is what do we mean by circulating and how do we do that? And the other word is, of course, better. Who, better for whom and who dictates that? Um, these are important questions that we need to unpack. Uh, another way of saying this would be to think about a little bit of our, uh, and when I say we and our and so on, I mean the design profession. And I know a lot of designers are in here. Um, we have been trained and conditioned by history and culture to uh, be good at creating stuff. We've taken raw materials and we have created things, new things. Um, and if we are expected to build and create things, I think there might be merit in stopping for a moment and instead think about what systems do we sustain when we do those things. And uh, here, here's a quote that usually is attributed to Marshall McLuhan, but I think it's actually his colleague John Culkin and probably Winston Churchill. It, it's a white male <laughs> who said this. Um, we shape our tools and then our tools shape us back. So when we as designers, we, uh, we, we need tools to create and design things. And given a specific moment in time, we create this nice tool that would help us. And then over time, that tool stays with us and starts to influence us back. And I think it's really uh, telling that if we have a dominating design tool like this, this is a journey map, fairly standard one. How many use journey mapping in, in the work? Uh, yeah, like almost everyone. And of course, if you have this kind of, and I just screenshotted this, um, I need to make a purchase and I need to purchase again. That, that's like the conclusion. And the timeline, of course, leads to sustaining a linear economy. So the tool forces us almost to sustain a linear economy model. It might be good, but if you don't pause and reflect, you might miss opportunities. And also, maybe it's good to question your responsibility as a designer. When we know that the linear economy is unsustainable and the alternative, uh, one of the alternatives, um, Martin mentioned that we have possible futures, but one possible future is to go to a more circular economy. And as, as you can see, of course, it's easier to design for this because it's fewer steps and it's a timeline. It's easy to understand. This one is fairly complex for us to design for because the tools we ha have been trained on have conditioned us to think like this. Oops, wrong direction. Speaking about easy to use tools, there are three buttons here and I still <laughs> did the wrong thing. Okay. Um, also, if we zoom out a little bit and talk about business models and business design and strategy, if the dominating business idea is transfer of ownership at the time of purchase, then we will default into a produce sell narrative, right? When in fact, this might be a better way to unpack what we can do using design, not only transfer uh, ownership at the point of sell, but actually designing all of this, redistribute, parts harvesting, recycling. And we have all these opportunities 
to design. It's not only about designing products. And for some of you who, who are deep into the sustainability movement and uh, uh, circular design and so on, you probably have seen uh, versions of these 10 R's. And I'm, when I'm saying R's, I mean the letter R in plural, <laughs> not anything else. Uh, refuse, reduce, redesign, etc., etc. And actually, recycling is the first modest stepping stone. It's not even uh, enough, right? I did it again. Damn it. Uh, <laughs> most green initiatives are actually here. And what we think when we, when we do these green initiatives in recycling is that we are actually thinking that we can somehow... Um, make that as part of the linear economy, while in fact, the majority will still be waste. So we only, when I, I think I read somewhere uh, last week that only 6% of plastic is actually recycled. And most Swedish households, they, they think they recycle about 80 or 90% of their waste, and in the end it's only 6 So if we want to be serious about this, we need to step up in this uh, ladder uh, and do other things than only recycling. The good news is that service uh, dominant logic and, and the theory behind service innovation can help us here because it's compatible with moving away from product design to as a service or uh, use perspectives. Um, we can also look at, for example, this is a, a paper I recommend you read. I won't have time to go through all of it, but here is a framework for circular design by Bokina Ritala, and they have um, a nifty construction here. They differentiate between resource strategies, they have three of those, narrowing, closing, and slowing loops, and then they have two innovation strategies, one open and one closed. And if you combine these, you get this nice little matrix of six archetypical uh, sustainable uh, or uh, circular uh, ideas, uh, basically, they are closed narrowing, open narrowing, closed cl slowing, open slowing, closed closing, and open closing. So there's a mnemonic for you. Uh, we won't have time to go through all of them, of course, but it, they're all in the paper. For example, if you, you combine closed and narrowing, closed is operating within your organization, and closed, narrowing the loop is to use less. So that would be save costs and resources internally and so on. So you can unpack all these and, and get a good sense of what circularity could mean. However, the paper stops here. What we can do then is to add data-driven prediction and AI-powered insights to this equation and get even more help uh, when it comes to circularity. But AI has become this... How many are tired of AI already? <laughs> right? It has become this tiresome notion. It's supposed to be a savior for everything, and, and uh, most people actually equate it with ChatGPT for some reason, even though that has been around for a year, and the field of AI is 70 years old. So we have a lot more than that to, to uh, uh, bring to the table, but basically AI is models trained on existing data to be able to classify, predict, or generate previously unseen data. So if we have that in mind, we can do a lot of things by combining design, AI, and circularity. And it could look something like this. Here are the circular strategies that I just outlined really shortly and briefly. This is what it means. Here's how AI can help in each of those. Um, for example, going back to the closed narrowing, if you want to reduce cost and resources internally, we're here now, then AI can of course help by um, supply chain optimization and internal efficiency. AI can also be useful, let's say, in closed closing. So that would mean continuous material reuse and recovering post-consumption materials. So if you use AI to optimize closed loop systems and identify opportunities for material reuse, you might be in a good place. But we're not done because design can also help in each of these. I love how every time I do something, all the phones come up. <laughs> Right. Um, so going back here, we can get help from AI in the supply chain optimization, but if you're a good service designer, you know how to use qualitative insight in the backstage to redefine workflows, to be compatible here. Going back to what Nora said earlier about 
the, the human-centeredness of AI application. If we, if we go to this example that I used before, and you have optimized your closed-loop systems for material reuse, well, you can combine that with um, good design, understanding human behavior, the, their internal drives, motivations, attitudes, in order for us to design great take-back programs that actually work and are not hard to use. So this is the kind of combinations I think we need to look for. Going back to the tool um, discussion then, so we should really think carefully about the tools we use because they condition our way of thinking. And actually, when it comes to thinking, I think we can actually add another R up here. So I think rethinking might be actually the best strategy. Because knowledge is our time's most important asset. I believe that thoroughly, <laughs> or profoundly, that the only way out of the mess we're in is via knowledge and competency. There's no way around it. If you don't understand and you can see um, the, the large scheme of things, we have a um, less likelihood to, to do something good about this. So maybe this is provocative, but I believe that if you are in the profession in 2024, if you don't have an educated stance on what AI is and circularity is, you're borderline unprofessional, I think. Hmm? <laughs> I can say that because I'm a white dude. Here, some topics we need to know about then in order for us to get more competency. All of this has to do with AI. And each and every box here is very complicated. So I'm, I'm not expecting anyone to know everything about every single thing here. But let's just take an example. If you don't understand water usage and energy usage per compute, and you don't understand legal and IP when it comes to data collection, then you will make some bad decisions regarding, for example, using GPT-4 in your services. Because I would argue that most chatbots that you will ever build can be done with a smaller model and still get a good result. Because I, I guess most of you by now know that the water and energy usage for those large language models are its huge. It's like a small city. And the data scraping um, is data theft, <laughs> if we're going to be honest. So food for thought. Um, the book talks a lot about the future of work and labor practices. Uh, and I also want to stop a little bit with the power distribution. Um, because the topics we need to know about... Oops, sorry. <laughs> so power distribution. We need to think about all those things as part of our design space. And we have to realize that new technologies, they tend to favor large-scale operations every time. Large scale is a beneficiary here. And that leads to concentration of uh, resources and power. And also technology often comes with this promise of efficiency and significant productivity gains. And sometimes those promises are fulfilled and sometimes they remain just rhetoric. Um, and when these advancements are realized, the question still remains, who benefits from them? And here we have two main strands, I would say. If the public sector is strong, it can leverage these new technologies, hopefully for the public good. It's not a guarantee, but hopefully. The other perspective is that if the market dominates, large corporations are the ones who mainly benefit, hopefully for the consumer's good. And I'm not going to put my foot down on any of these perspectives, but however you think this power should be distributed, most people are dependent on the genuine and authentic representation of their interests. And that is never an automatic process. It always happens because someone said something or did something. Perhaps using a design tool. Perhaps managing the status quo. All right, I think um, I'm pretty much done. I think we need tools that speak to these kinds of frameworks rather than the traditional ones that we have. Each of these you can read more about in, in various sources that I've... It's in the book, but also in the paper that I uh, uh, recommended. So we started with this question, and hopefully, uh, I 
at least sketched a little bit on how circulation could be done and also uh, discussed a little bit uh, better for whom. That, I think, is important. So thank you so much for listening, but most importantly, thank you for thinking. <laughs>